The next speaker we have is um, James Earlham, who's the chair for the Climate, Energy and Health at the Public Health Association of South Africa, otherwise called PASA. Um, James is a teacher, researcher and advocate for mitigating climate change and improving public health by means of healthy energy and lifestyle choices. So he's also a senior lecturer in the Department of Family, Community and Emergency Care at the UCT Faculty of Health Sciences. Sciences. Um, and I mentioned that he's the chair of the special interest group at PASA. He's an epidemiologist with an MSc in climate change and development, and is currently working on a PhD, opportunities and barriers to implementing education for sustainable healthcare in Africa, a South African case study. And James will be speaking about the preparedness of the South African health system to cope with the, with the impacts of climate change. Over to you, James. Thank you, Aziza, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to present. Um, in the next 10 minutes, I'll try to just give a snapshot of um, some aspects of the health system's preparedness uh, when measured against some international benchmarks of what that means. I trust you can see my title slide, and now I'm moving on to the uh, next slide. Here I present the, um, some key findings from the WHO Health and Climate Change Global Survey Report, um, which I reviewed last year in preparation for meeting with the Department of Health. And um, just in looking at some of the indicators, um, you can see here a table that shows that um, of these 10 key health and climate change indicators, um, that South Africa had achieved only two out of those 10 um, with respect to leadership and governance, and it showed that another two were under development. So as of 2021, when this report was released, um, it wasn't looking too good, and we now have another three years until the next uh, survey will be published. Last year, ahead of COP26, um, I helped develop this Health and Climate Network policy brief um, for COP26 on sustainable and climate resilient health systems, which made a number of key observations about the linkages between climate and health and the need for such systems. And I'm just going to unpack some of the recommended actions and related policies briefly. Firstly, that, um, that such health systems should build the capacity and resilience of health workers and facilities and systems, and that related policy recommendations include conducting health and vulnerability adaptation assessments and developing a health national adaptation plan. Secondly, that um, countries should increase the health workforce and prioritize curricula and institutional policies on environmentally sustainable healthcare, and that they should provide sustainable energy access to healthcare facilities without energy access. The second um, action was around developing sustainable and climate resilient health systems, which provide primary healthcare for all and are underpinned by rights based, -based approach. And the policy recommendations here were about building the resilience of vulnerable communities through access to the determinants of health um, that Louis has mentioned, such as nutritious diets, clean water, clean energy, and sustainable transport, and integrating public health provision into national climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. The third action related to decarbonizing health systems in a health centered way. And um, here, calling on countries to commit to decarbonize, ideally by 2050 or earlier, and to improve the resilience of healthcare systems in line with the COP26 health program, which I'll say more about on the next slide. And then to regulate emissions from the production of medicines and medical supplies, including the pharmaceutical industry. And then the fourth, um, Action was around prioritizing, promoting, and facilitating investment in sustainable and resilient healthcare. And so, here, looking at increasing national and global financial flows for health systems research, innovation, and surveillance of climate sensitive diseases and outbreaks. 
and creating mechanisms and incentives for cross-sectional coordination across government and its supply stakeholders. So just um, the COP26 health program that I referred to um, has been adopted by over 60 countries to date, um, not South Africa yet. Um, it's a program supported by the WHO and Healthcare Without Harm and others. And I'll summarize briefly two of its initiatives, namely building climate resilient health systems and developing low carbon sustainable health systems. So the first com commitment on climate resilient health systems includes those vulnerability and adaptation assessments that I mentioned at a population level or a healthcare facility level, and then a health national adaptation plan, and both of those should facilitate access to climate change funding um, for health, both from national and global sources. And then the second commitment of the program is sustainable low carbon health systems, which includes setting a target for health system net zero emissions. So by 2050 or earlier, conducting a baseline assessment using a um, emissions tracking tool of emissions from the health system and then developing an action plan for a sustainable health system, including reduced air pollution um, from the health sector. So here's a brief example of some of the challenges in achieving these commitments. Um, earlier this year, a group of us from UCT faculty wrote an open letter to the SMJ, challenging the 2019 directive by the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. And that medical devices intended by the original manufacturer for single use may only be used once and may not be reprocessed and must be disposed of after use. And of course, we're all aware of just what a huge mountain of waste um, and the related emissions that this is responsible for. Um, this Times Live article in April reported that despite multiple attempts to engage the regulator, SAPRA had said that the matter was non negotiable. And a follow-up um, this week um, has been made because more than four months later, we're still awaiting um, a response for reviewing that um, directive. I turn now to the official response from the Department of Health um, that they presented at the first conference in June of the Climate and Health Africa Network for Collaboration and Engagement, which is a sub-Saharan or mostly Southern African um, network around climate and health. And what follows are some of the key points from the National Director of Environmental Health um, on the climate change guidelines and the department's approach to climate financing to date. So just briefly, these are the health risks associated with climate change and some of the um, guidelines and strategies that have been developed. Um, I'll provide a bit of further detail on only those first two guidelines, namely the Heat Health Action Guidelines and the Indoor Air Quality Guidelines, um, which are available on the department's website. So in reporting on climate change activities in the health sector, the uh, director spoke about the review of the National Climate Change and Health Adaptation Plan, 2014 to 2019 version, which focuses on the short, medium and long-term implications of climate on health, with objectives that, that as you see, that include aligning health policies with climate change adaptation and mitigation and the risk and vulnerability assessments and or RVAs to identify high risk areas and populations susceptible to climate change. So the initial phase of the RVA was published as a thematic content analysis study of climate change and health expert interviews, which is available in the African Journal of Primary Healthcare and Family Medicine. And then the final stage has involved capacity building on the national RBA tool for the health sector in nine provinces and 52 health districts uh, to date. The National Climate Change and Health Adaptation Plan for 2020 to 2024 has apparently been finalized, um, but is not yet publicly available. Other climate, health, uh, climate change activities reported on include training um, on the 2020 Heat Health Action Guidelines, the ongoing development of um, indicators with the MRC and DFFE and appointments to a National Climate Change and Health um, Steering Committee and development of terms of reference. 
And then finally, the domestic um, indoor air quality guidelines were developed to assist environmental health practitioners in undertaking indoor air quality assessments, providing mitigation guidance to manage indoor air quality, to support monitoring and research and respond to complaints about indoor air quality. Progress has been made as indicated in building the capacity of EHPs and conducting baseline assessments in Highfields and Waterberg priority areas, and an air quality and health focus group has apparently been established. And then around financing, uh, the FFE is key in financing climate change programs within the health sector, which as you see has included RVAs since 2019. An intern has been appointed to support the Department on Climate Change through a SANBI grant by the Government of Flanders for climate change adaptation, and further funding is needed for developing indicators, developing a national strategy, and appointing staff to implement the guidelines. Okay, so that was a very brief um, summary. It leaves me with some questions um, that we can discuss about our preparedness. And so the WHO COP26 health program seems to be an important um, initiative to uh, be a part of. And there are questions about the timeline on the adaptation strategy, the adaptation plan, and then the effectiveness of the guidelines and the development of indicators, etc. Okay, so those are some of my questions, and um, thank you for your attention. I look forward to the uh, discussion afterwards.